A French and Indonesian scientific expedition has explored a largely unknown region of the island of Papua New Guinea. The researchers ventured into one of the planet's richest areas of biodiversity, the Lengaru Mountains. For the scientists, the territory is like an open-air laboratory. It was formed 11 million years ago when the Australian and Pacific tectonic plates collided. The relief which soared up raised uncrossable barricades, bristling with peaks, beset by abrupt cliffs, dug out by chasms. The animals and plants that lived there were trapped. To survive, they had no choice but to adapt very quickly to the new conditions. The waters of this part of the world are separated from the vast networks of oceans and rivers in which species can freely circulate. How did aquatic flora and fauna develop here? The expedition encountered several unusual creatures. A blind fish, made translucent by its life in darkness. An unexpected freshwater tortoise in a drowned cave. And pink-tipped dolphins as yet unlisted. Samples taken have been sent to leading research laboratories. They will enrich our knowledge of one of the parts of the world which is, in many ways, a conservatory of life as it was millions of years ago. All of the sea and inland water samples taken from Lengaru are conserved at the Jakarta Research Center for Oceanography. Regis Hogde, Longon Puyu, and Didier Orel, in charge of the expedition's marine research, meet the Indonesian colleagues who they worked with in the field. Oh, hey, there you are. Selamat pagi, Nas. Selamat pagi. Hey, welcome nice to on. see you. Hey, hey Regis, welcome to Jakarta. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you again. Me too. <laughs> yeah. It's a pleasure. Before we are working in the open air, in the sea, yeah. and now we are in Dubai. the lab. Yeah, mm -hmm. The main objective of their work together is to sequence the DNA of the samples they have collected and analyze it. Oh, it's in good condition, good. Yes, I think if we can uh, start with these uh, samples, the DNA extraction. Sounds hmm? good. Yes. We left these samples at Caimana when we left Papua New Guinea. Now we've got them back at Jakarta, and I'm very pleased there are no nasty surprises. The first step is to analyze them. Each specialist working on the different groups studied will lead an inquiry using the tools available to write the history of the Longaru Mountains so as to understand what were the evolutionary processes that led to its exceptional biodiversity. The rough sides of the Lengaru Mountains are highly promising for the researchers. They are composed of limestone formations known as casts. Millions of years of erosion have sculpted a strange landscape, maze-like and deeply fractured, on the surface as well as below the sea, creating a mosaic of ecosystems in which living species have had to evolve or vanish. In the area, the scarce scientific data there is was collected in the 19th century. At that time, techniques were a long way behind those used nowadays, so much so that almost everything remains to be discovered. The aim of the mission is to draw up an inventory of the organisms that inhabit the submerged casts from the surface down to a depth of 100 meters. For several years to explore, we've been using recyclers which are used mainly to recycle the gas we breathe out. This means a special treatment separately of the gas which has been exhaled. That takes place in this unit. Here the carbon dioxide produced by an organism is fixed and at the same time the air is enriched in oxygen 
replacing the oxygen consumed by the organism. Using this recycler equipped with two bottles of three liters each, we can dive for three hours. If we had to use traditional diving helmets, the logistics would be impossible for this boat. get in the water quick because I, I think if we weighed ourselves we're close to 200 kilograms. fantastic and surprising universe appears to the divers. Luminous squid pass by like gracious ghosts. A jellyfish with an extravagant shape wanders through the dark water. The researchers deliberately limit their samples to the specimens which pose the most questions. They're happy to film or photograph the others. Closer to the surface, plankton, astonishingly abundant, nourishes unusually rich life. All kinds of shapes and the brightest of colors explode in a perfectly preserved Garden of Eden. It's a real blessing for science. A placid carpet shark, under threat elsewhere in the world, has found here one of the few refuges which remain. This delicate sea pen feeds on the microplankton that sails where the currents lead. A gigantic sea anemone gives sanctuary to a colony of tiny translucent prawns. As for the nudibranch, commonly called sea slugs, they're here in large numbers. These hermaphrodite mollusks parade in extravagant costumes with unusual shapes and colors. Although they look like tropical flowers, these crinoids are nonetheless animals with a skeleton, close cousins of sea urchins and starfish. The divers are struck by their number and extraordinary diversity. Appearing 500 million years ago, crinoids have survived all the crises of biodiversity which have happened on the planet. Paleontologists consider them to be a reference group of capital importance for our knowledge of the living world. I don't know what this is. I've never seen this before. The specimens collected will be carefully prepared to arrive in good condition for the specialists who will study them, including this astonishing starfish. Uh, I never saw it in Western Indonesia. So in Eastern Indonesia, uh, only here in Langguru before. So many dives and this one my first. Yeah. In the Oceanography Research Center of Jakarta, a production line is put in place to extract the DNA of the samples taken from the waters of Langguru. It's difficult to distinguish between species with very close morphologies with the naked eye. Only molecular analysis can determine whether apparently similar individuals are from the same species or not. 
At Lenguru, thanks to the use of genetic analysis, we expect to discover a large number of species. In fact, the ultimate goal of this approach for us is to offer scientific proof to political decision makers so they can register this exceptional region as a World Heritage Site. The crinoids, so many and so colourful in the submarine depths of Lengaru, captivate the researchers. Sampai pada bentuk kaki-kakinya yang mencengkeram itu, mm -hmm. itu kita lihat bentuknya bahwa ada duri-duri atau enggak, itu kundernya mm -hmm. berapa. Mm -hmm. The scientists have sent specimens to their colleagues at the Marine Biology Station of the Natural History Museum of Konkano. They are given to Nadia Amezian, one of the rare specialists in the world of these animals which we still know little of. There are lots of questions. How do they live at these depths? How do they reproduce? How are they able to last through geological ages? So it's all these questions which attracted me to these animals, and the mystery which surrounds them since it's a group which at present is very poorly known by scientists and even less well known by the public. First, Nadia Amizian consults the available literature and compares the specimens she has to all the crinoids already catalogued around the world. Then, she examines their skeletons in detail. Oh yes, I like this view. That's a typical echinoderm network. No other organism in the animal kingdom has a skeleton of this kind. We'll look at that in more detail. This ossicle here is in full growth. So what's interesting is that even when they're adult, the skeleton continues to grow. Of course, it's a lot slower. Crinoids have developed the peculiarity of growing all through their lives and can live up to 60 years. But what fascinates scientists is their ability, exceptional in the animal kingdom, to regenerate all of their organs, including nerves and viscera. So what do you see there? Is that regeneration or not? Yes, it's clearly regeneration. You can see its arms very well, with a smaller diameter, a lot shorter, with a slightly paler colour. It's been under stress and lost its arms. Now it's growing them again. Why does regeneration interest researchers so much? When we can understand all the processes and mechanisms of this regeneration, we may have a way of curing cancer. The crinoid regeneration process requires very rapid production of stem cells, and it is this proliferation which interests cancer researchers. For grafts, for patients undergoing chemotherapy, this mechanism favours the multiplication of repairing cells as opposed to cancerous cells. The crinoids collected at Lengaru thus contribute to better knowledge of the biodiversity of this group. They also allow improved exploration of their therapeutic potential. On the ship which sails the waters of Lengaru, researchers have been alerted by an interesting piece of information. Well, now no one's ready. This patrol's going to take time. We know that there's a sedentary whale shark because it's fed every day by fishermen. And we're going to try to take DNA samples to be able to position it relative to the rest of the population. It'll be feeding on fish, so it'll be fairly static so we can approach to collect fragments.
Whale sharks are known to be perpetual wanderers. Usually they follow banks of plankton and microscopic animal or vegetable prey which drift with the currents. This giant, followed by pilot fish, belongs to the small family of filterers. Its large mouth swallows enormous quantities of water which are expelled through its imposing gills while the prey is swallowed. The specimen which the team has discovered has however developed strange behavior which has never been documented before. It literally sucks the net. It crushes the fish between its jaws and sucks the mash which this causes. According to the fishermen, one or several whale sharks visit their nets each time they come back from fishing. The scientists take into account all the information from the inhabitants. If these whale sharks are sedentary, they may well be an uncatalogued species. To be certain, systematic DNA samples must be taken. So here we've just received the DNA sequencing results from the whale shark samples. For example, there we have an absolutely identical sequence to a specimen captured in the Indian Ocean off Mozambique, and a second sequence which is identical to a specimen caught elsewhere in the Pacific. So what does that mean? In fact, it confirms that the whale shark is one of the rare species in the world that has a cosmopolitan population. That means that all the whale sharks in all the world's oceans make up one population. This is caused by the fact that indeed whale sharks during their lives can go around the planet several times, migrating, moving from ocean to ocean, and they've done that for millions of years. Although the Lingaroo whale shark belongs to a common species, already catalogued, a certain number of things remain to be resolved. At the Paris Aquarium, Regis Hockde consults shark specialist Bernard Serre from the Research Institute for Development. So Bernard, here are the images of samples taken from a group of whale sharks, and the question is, could this group have become isolated? Could there be sedentary individuals in this region of Lengaru? We know that whale sharks are very mobile. Large females, for example, can travel distances of over 3,000 kilometers, and we know that they return to their starting point. Now, how do we know about these movements? Whale sharks have marks on their bodies, which are a kind of identity card for each shark. We take photos of the flanks and enter them into a database. Currently, there are 7,000 sharks in that database. The second method is, of course, electronic beacons. These little devices full of electronics are placed on the sharks and tell us about their movements. These methods have shown that whale sharks are very mobile and that over cycles of many years, while the young stay in coastal zones. And what we have here are youth centers, where there are essentially only young sharks, you see. Why? Because in these zones, these bays, like in the Bay of Lingaru, it's very rich in plankton, and the young sharks find the abundant food necessary for their growth there. So, in my opinion, they're not sedentary. It's simply a stage in the long whale shark cycle. Whale sharks are poorly known because of the diversity of their habitats and their long journeys. Lengaru shines new light on migration routes, on the existence of nurseries for the young, and feeding methods that have never been listed before.
Lake Sawiki is a vast expanse of brackish water which communicates with the sea by a deep, narrow natural channel. According to current wisdom, the coast of Papua New Guinea is inhabited by a single species of crocodile, the porosus, which is still called a sea crocodile. It also lives on Australian coasts. The rough terrain of Lingaroo leads to many exchanges of sea and fresh water. The team suspects that land crocodiles live alongside sea crocodiles. This would be a first. Capturing young specimens would allow the theory to be confirmed. Right, I'm not squeezing it. It's his cry of... Uh... It's got webbed feet, all right. Another characteristic, you see? You see the transparent eyelid? It's like a diving mask. It lets them see underwater. You see? Oh, yes. It's well done, hmm? What's the adult's maximum size? Between 3 meters and 3 meters 50. Here we can... You see? He opens the trap and closes it. He opens the trap and closes it. So it can bite underwater without swallowing water. Yes. You like my little leaf, huh? Look. The crocodile is an indicator of the health of a region. When man enters a region, it's the first animal to suffer. It's very sensitive to modifications of the ecosystem. So either they leave, move off, or they're driven out. Now, we're going to put you in a sack, and then tomorrow morning we'll take a little scale from you, and then we'll let you go again where we got you. Looks nice like that. Well, that's cute. What you have to understand is that in Southeast Asia, crocodile populations are declining everywhere. There are a lot of places where they've just disappeared. However, in the lake of Suiki at Lengaru, we can see that there are still a great number of crocodiles. During night observations that we've made during our mission, we've found over 50 individuals per square kilometer, which is enormous. It's a very, very high density. Sea crocodiles are present in Lake Suiki, Crocodilus porosus, which is characterized by the absence of large scales on its occipital bone just behind the skull, as well as a second species, Crocodilus novaguinea, which is more of a land crocodile and which does have these large scales on its occipital bone. That's a first as far as I know, for there's no other place in Southeast Asia, even in Australia, where you can find two different crocodile species living alongside each other. This discovery opens up new perspectives, and new observations will be needed to understand the ecological and behavioral factors which lead to such an unusual coexistence of land and sea crocodiles. A new mission has begun. Its aim is to explore an isolated high altitude lake which has evolved separately. There's a strong possibility that this has led to the survival and development of unknown species. Laurent Pouillot hopes to discover new specimens of rainbow fish. It's a quite ordinary looking fish which is only six to eight centimeters long. But following the cataclysms which have marked the history of this region, the species has dispersed into communities which have all evolved differently. Constructing the genealogical tree of the rainbow fish could reveal the crucial steps in the genesis of the Lengaru Mountains to the researchers.
the team of scientists begins a long and difficult ascent. We have to reach the first lake today or it's not good. The conditions are difficult. It's 35 degrees Celsius and the humidity is around 90 degrees. In places, the slope becomes a wall. How can you walk with such a thing? Look, there's even a leech. Hello. In these latitudes, the night falls very quickly, and in the darkness, it's impossible to continue. The team has to force the pace to be on time. We've gone one kilometer since the pass. At this rate, we won't get there before nightfall. So we'll lighten the load of the slowest hikers. That way we can progress at two to three kilometers an hour. Then we'll be good. We'll leave some of the load here, come what may, okay? OK, we're off. Lightening some of the load has paid off. At the close of day, the team finally arrive at the lake. There it is, before them. Crocodiles are moving in the shallow waters. The team prefers to make a temporary camp quite far from the shore. A little wash after all that does you good. Come and help yourself. The camp wakes up on the banks of the lake. Look, we see a fish struggling there. I'm going to take my shirt off. Don't pull too hard. I'll go release it. If you see a crocodile, let me know. We saw some earlier. So? A new one. It's a female. Yeah, 
The thing about these rainbow fish, they don't look much when they're stressed, as they are now, but as soon as you put them in the water, the colors appear when they're sedated. The small size, a head in proportion to its body, the blue band and the orange stripes all lead to the thought that the captured fish belongs to an ancient line that hasn't yet been described. DNA analysis in the laboratory confirms that it is indeed a primitive species at the origins of all rainbow fish. This discovery offers to the researchers a fundamentally important subject to study. Thanks a lot for all the help you've brought us. Bravo. The Langaroo Mountains, split by countless crevices, offer many meeting places for fresh water and seawater. This is what happens in the subterranean aquatic network of the Diaboniara, an immense labyrinth of caves and passages, partially flooded and until now unexplored. Perfect. Yes, I think you can get ready here and get into the water here. That's what we'll do. Otherwise, the bats, there's a lot of guano which will drop into the boat. We'll get ready in the boat and get into the water there. Hi. Scientific exploration proceeds in stages. First, the divers map the submerged part of the network. Secondly, they list the organisms present. But the task is complicated as the sediment which has built up on the floor is light and unstable. The slightest movement raises clouds which obscure visibility. Few creatures can live in such a dark mineral desert. Suddenly, the divers are surprised to find themselves face to face with a magnificent estuary turtle. As a rule, this isn't a favorable environment for a turtle. How did it get here? Is it here by chance? Have others of its kind colonized the place? This encounter raises many questions and is one of the enigmas which excite the research teams. Huh? That's nice, eh? Yes, it is. While the divers ask themselves about the unexpected turtle, Speleologists explore the dry part of the cave. Here, the heat is suffocating. In the beams of lamps, stone concretions which have developed over thousands of years take on the appearance of a petrified jungle. Darkness is total, and few nutriments make it down to this isolated environment. The species which live here have had to acclimatize to extremely strong constraints. In these unusual surroundings, the research team make an unexpected discovery. Bones bear witness that a large crocodile has managed to wander down here. When moving the skull, Lauren Puyo fleetingly glimpses a strange shape. Wow, it's a blind fish. Ho oh, ho! Well, that's nuts. We've never found that before. I saw it go past but couldn't do anything about it. I just saw it. I'm not leaving till I've got that fish. Oh. 
What's magic is that that fish was just below the jaw when the jaw was lifted. If that's so, there could be several which must have eaten it. All these little fish would have benefited from this bounty to feed themselves while it decomposed. Now that's magic. Just magic. It's often difficult to judge the importance of a discovery straight away, but this time the expedition members have no doubt. These little colorless fish, which have completely lost their eyes, will be a choice subject for scientists lucky enough to study them. With the agreement of the Indonesian authorities, the specimen is sent to Philippe Keith, director of the Department of Aquatic Environment and Population at the Natural History Museum of Paris. So the specimens should be there. There they are. They're very small. They're the ones you brought back. Oh yes, heck, I didn't remember. There. Since they're cave dwellers, they've developed specialized systems sensitive. So we'll look at that in the laboratory. Let's go. You see, what's quite incredible is that they've already lost their eyes. So that's it there. The emplacement was about there, yes? That's it. Those are the two places which would have been eyes. OK. Well, they're not there. And you see on the snout they've developed quite incredible sensory buds. That's all those diverticula you can see all over here and there. Yes, all the diverticula which go from the part beneath the eye to the extremity of the snout and which allow it to perceive all the variations of the environment. You can see clearly. In particular, variations in the current's pressure, probably temperature too. It can detect its prey quite easily thanks to these sensory organs. Since obviously it can't see them because the place is completely dark. And you see, what's interesting about these fish is to be able to study what are called otoliths, which are these little bones which are in the internal ear of the fish. We've got here the birth of the individual. OK. This represents what we call the nucleus. And then you can see these rays here, which go right to the end of the otolith, and each ray represents one day. That's to say... One day. Yes, that's to say that we can measure between the birth of the individual and the end of the otolith. We call this the otolith black box, in fact. It's like the black box of a plane which records all the physical and chemical characteristics of the environments which the fish has crossed. You can, for example, sample a particular ray. That's it. On one ray, for example this one, if we want to know if there really was a migration towards a salt environment or not, or if they were isolated in the cave, We'd look for elements which characterize a marine environment. So with a laser which follows a row and analyzes all the elements we're looking for, from birth to the end of the otolith. Like that, we know if the fish left the cave at any point. We have, thanks to this discovery, really a biological model that's really interesting because we can see how an animal, this fish here, adapts to an extreme environment, which are there in completely dark places with very, very few nutritional elements. The Diaboniara black box remains to be exploited. There's no doubt that its decoding will reveal the surprising turns of event that have marked the development of this little being, new knowledge of the living world. What about the other surprise from the cave, the turtle that no one expected in one of the submerged galleries? Thanks. 
So that's the turtle we met when we were exploring the drowned cast at Uriza. What's really surprising is that we didn't expect to find it so deep in the underground network. How deep in the network is it? Well, not very deep, a few metres in depth. However, in terms of penetration within the network, we're already quite deep. A few dozen metres, really in the cave network, in complete darkness. So this individual is 30 or so centimetres large. How can the presence of a turtle like that be explained here? It's really astonishing, quite unusual. You could think that it came in search of food. It's true that there are a lot of bats in the submerged parts. Surely adults and young bats fall into the water. This could be a food source and an explanation for its presence. I've tried to identify its species. There's a certain number of morphometric criteria, such as the distance between the nose and the neck compared to the length of its carapace, the number of toes and the number of claws on the forward feet, as well as on the back feet. And of course, the ornamentation on the shell, on the stomach, as well as the back, which are really characteristic and specific to each species. And in fact, when you look at all of these criteria, clearly, our specimen belongs to the Elisa novaginae species. And looking at its population distribution area, that corresponds closely. So that's right at the spot where you observed it. Exactly, so it's entirely coherent. Elysia Novaginae has been listed since 1874, but had never before been observed in a cavern habitat. A neighboring species, Elysia rodini, was discovered in 2016 south of the island, and other species perhaps remain to be discovered. Alingaru, the fish-filled waters are a paradise for dolphins, which gather there in large numbers to hunt. In this crowd, which sweeps the brackish waters of the estuaries relentlessly, scientists have noticed individuals with characteristics they have never seen elsewhere. Sophie Caroy, marine mammal specialist, is looking for these mysterious specimens. In an estuary washed by the flow of the tides, she photographs and films a group of dolphins which seems to correspond to the description. Diving to observe them is impossible since the water is troubled by alluvium channeled by the river and the currents are strong. So each image is precious and rare. This one is different in many ways, notably the distribution of coloring, the shape of the dorsal, the rostrum, the snout seems longer. And all that is what we're trying to document. So yes, it's exciting. Ah, yes, this is the first time that I've seen them up close. Do you think they're the ones you saw? I'm sure they're the same. They have exactly the same characteristics. You see, depigmentation on the caudal and dorsal fins. Can you see the general shape? For me, these are Sousa dolphins, so-called humpback dolphins, even if these have no hump. But look at the colors they have. They turn pink when they're adults. And here, it's not at all the case. We have localized depigmentation, and at the head, you see what's called the melon, this bump. Well, I have the impression that it's more prominent. It's more marked, I agree with you. And so for you, it would be a population with a bit more Sousa variability. Well, are they differentiated genetically? We'd need samples. Only a comparative DNA analysis will allow them to know if this species is different from the others. Laurent Poyot and Amos, a guide who knows the estuary well, will attempt to take a tissue sample from one of the curious dolphins. The aim is to obtain a tiny piece of flesh. It's a non-invasive form of sampling which doesn't hurt the animal. It's a small sting. 
The maximum distance normally to use such a tool is 10 to 15 meters. And this morning, the closest we can get is roughly 50 meters. So that's why this is really going to be difficult. But we'll have to get it. I saw one in front there. More often than might be thought, luck plays a role in the success of a mission because the researchers have to contend with many indeterminable things like the unpredictable weather or the terrain which they have no control over. Today, fortunately, success is on science's side. In Indonesia and then in France, samples taken from the dolphins with pink tips have been analyzed. Its DNA has been sequenced. It is compared to the DNA of all the dolphins listed and made available for research in world databases. All of the published data, including the most recent, has been searched. Hi, Sophie. Hi, Laurent. So, the dolphin results? You'll be disappointed. Disappointed? Because it's a known species. Where is it known? Australia. As well, this came out during our mission. While we were on our mission? Yes. That's crazy. How come they're still finding new species of dolphins in Australia nowadays? Well, listen, even nowadays, you know, although dolphins are big, they live under the water, so they're not easy to observe. To be able to say that it's a different species, there have to be a certain number of indicators which can resemble another species. And the morphology? For morphology, according to them, there's only a few individuals there which have depigmentation. Ah, so you think that the population of Lengaru could be different from that in Australia? Yes, because they're animals that don't much like deep water. So it's not likely that the individuals at Lengaru cross the sea all the way to Australia. But for a few weeks, Laurent Poyo and his team could have had the privilege to describe a new dolphin species. The discovery of the Lengaru dolphins is nonetheless a first, which poses many questions. It's not easy to explain how dolphins from the same species could live at least a thousand kilometers apart. That's the Lengaru population. And here we have different populations of the new species of dolphin in northern Australia. So there is a plausible hypothesis. There I'm representing the land part of New Guinea and the Australian part. You can see they're separated by what's known as the Torres Strait. You have to understand that during the different ice ages, the sea level fell. And we know, for example, that the level fell 20,000 years ago by at least 40 meters. So we can see that when the sea was 40 meters lower, there was a land connection between New Guinea and Australia, and the maximum was minus 120 meters. And probably at that time, there were exchanges between the populations of the time from New Guinea and from Australia. The observations made at Lengaru bear on just a few individuals. 
However, thanks to images captured in one place and another, here is a graphic reconstitution of an Australian individual and one from Lengaroo. Their pigmentation is different, and even though they belong to the same species, the two populations have probably evolved differently through the ages. It would be interesting to compare the feeding habits and respective languages of each group. Over time, they may have developed distinctly different behavior. Scientific study of the pink-tipped dolphin has only just begun. The results of the Lengaroo expedition are still preliminary. Exhaustive study of the samples and specimens taken in the field will require many more years of research and analysis. By choosing to explore this region, the researchers have hit the mark. Its territory really is the conservatory of life which the team hoped to discover. Enthusiastic about their discoveries, the scientists will work for the listing of Lengaroo as a World Heritage Site. In this way, the site can be turned into a sanctuary where, over time, we can learn much about the history of our planet.